Hello, so I'm going to show you an update on my channel situation because it's a very important update if you like my videos because I'm splitting my content into multiple channels instead of just having it all on one channel. So if you're interested in seeing the rest of this series or whatever uh, other videos like this one, um, it's a very important announcement to see, but if you've already seen this announcement in other videos or you just don't care, um, then skip to this timestamp to get right into the video. And hope you enjoy. Um, hello, and today I'm going to give you a rundown of major changes that are happening to my channel, or channels, I should say. So basically, I'm going to be splitting my channel into multiple channels um, of their own categories of what my channel revolves around. I just said channel a lot, but hope you understand what I'm saying. So the reason I'm doing this is because how the YouTube algorithm works is it says if a viewer on average watches every video you upload, your videos are better, so it shows them to more people. But the problem with my channel is that I react and do so many different content about so many different things that people, most people aren't interested in everything I react to. So some, most people just watch one topic that I react to. So, you know, they just watch my Beatles reactions or they just watch my NBA videos or they just watch my TV show Breaking Bad or Chris Chan reactions. So basically I'm going to be spreading my uh, content into multiple different channels so that people who like that content, they're going to watch more a higher percentage of each uh, video on those channels. So YouTube will promote it more to help promote my channel, to promote all my videos in general more. So here's the rundown um, here. So this channel, Lyric Reacts, will exclusively be for reactions that don't fit my other reaction channels. So basically, this is for my channel for reacting to whatever the hell I want. This channel will stay as reacting to whatever the hell I want as the original channel. So um, that's basically what the channel will be. Whatever the hell I want um, is going to be reacting. And all these reaction channels will have daily uploads. So next we have the Lyric Reacts NBA channel. This channel will be for daily NBA reactions. So if you want my NBA reactions, go subscribe to that channel. Um, I will be continuing to upload all my videos to this channel for the next around two weeks and putting this disclaimer at the beginning of each video so you, people understand before I just start uploading to a channel that no one subscribed to. Um, but eventually, subscribe to that channel so eventually I will start only uploading my NBA reactions to Lyric Reacts NBA. I'll have daily NBA reactions as well uh, as weekly NBA full game reactions. So we're going to react to a bunch of classic NBA games on that channel. And next we have Lyric Reacts Music. So if you watch my Beatles reactions mainly, those are the music reactions I've done so far, start with this, go to this channel. We'll be doing um, reacting to uh, the Beatles solo albums as well as we're eventually going to get to a bunch of classic albums. I plan to do a bunch of classic albums in chronological order. And I'm also going to start my hip hop journey where I'm going to react to um, hip hop albums in chronological order, the history of hip hop. So uh, I plan to do one non hip hop album and one hip hop album per week. And it will be all, I plan to react to both in chronological order, so I think it would be a really cool experiment to do. There will also be daily song reactions from those albums, so hopefully you will enjoy that. So if you like my music reactions here, you want to see more music reactions, go to that channel, Lyric Reacts Music. Next we have Lyric Reacts Media. This channel will be exclusively for TV and movie reactions. So right now I am reacting to three shows, quote unquote. Um, those being Breaking Bad, Chris Chan, A Comprehensive History, and Attack on Titan. I'm counting the Chris Chan series, even though it's a YouTube series, as a show, because it is a series. Um, so, um, if you like to react to any of those, my Breaking Bad reactions, my Chris Chan reactions, or my Attack on Titan reactions, go to that channel. That's where those reactions are going to move to. And there is, I am planning on uploading two react two reactions of two episodes of each of those per week as well as one movie reaction i am actually counting the beatles get back documentary as a movie just because the episodes are so long so if you want to watch the beatles get back documentary you my reaction to that also subscribe to that channel um and also yeah weekly movie reactions as well as two episodes of three shows per week and that's it for my reaction channels, but I also have two other channels. First of all is Lyric Rumbles MBA. I have already started uploading on this channel months ago, so I already have some original content up there, but the quality is going to improve a lot. It is for my original MBA content. So if you like my MBA content, if you want to see original MBA content, go to that channel, Lyric Rumbles MBA. I plan to upload one video there every one every 
one to two weeks because you know, obviously that takes a lot more editing and work than the reaction videos. And then I have a new channel called Lyric Rumbles, just Lyric Rumbles. That channel is the original content that is not NBA related. So you subscribe to that channel to get my original content that is not going to be NBA related. Um, it's going to be the channel I'm probably going to work the hardest on um, in general. Um, and it's not going to, you're not going to see a video on there for a little bit because uh, it's, uh, it's going to take a lot of work for those videos. And my first video I plan on playing there is the Beatles Iceberg Explained, which is a video I'm really hyped for making, but it's going to take a little bit. So subscribe to that channel preemptively to get all those uh, videos. And yeah, so basically that's the gist. Um, the, my six channels, Lyric Reacts, Lyric Reacts NBA, Lyric Reacts Music, Lyric Reacts Media, Lyric, Reac Lyric Rumbles, NBA and Lyric Rumbles. So subscribe to all six of those channels um, if you like all of it. If you like all my content, go subscribe to all six channels, but if you're interested in certain parts of my content that you only watch, subscribe to the ones that fit you the most. Um, and yeah, sorry for this long um, explanation, but I had to get the word out so you know which where the, my content is going to go now. And so yeah, uh, hope you enjoy the content coming up. Hi, my name is Lyric, and today we're going to be t continuing this series of um, explaining the breakdown, basically, of from the YouTuber What's the Dirt, go subscribe to him now, of the Kendrick Lamar Drake diss tracks. So, we are now on to Euphoria. This is the latest one he's released. He's not released uh, analysis of all the other diss tracks that have came out. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this, the analysis, I think I can understand why, because the analysis of this one diss track is over an hour long, an hour long analysis of a six minute song. It's how you know it's so intricate and so much detail in every single bar. So yeah, this is gonna be really interesting to watch. So yeah, if you like some of my hip hop stuff, we're gonna go on the hip hop journey, uh, starting on this channel, but it's gonna eventually move to the Lyric Reacts music channel, so go subscribe to that if you want that. But let's get into it, the Euphoria. Uh, this actually explained over an hour long, so stay back, grab some popcorn or whatever, grab some gummy worms or whatever, and uh, Let's get into it. The Euphoria Disc actually explained. Like and subscribe to support a small creator. Obviously, go watch the original video by What's the Dirt First. Fantastic creator. Really good at breaking down these bars and explaining it in a comprehensive way. Great editing and everything. So, let's get into it. Alright, guys. So, I'm clearly behind the curve right now. Disc tracks are dropping left, right, and center. <laughs> and all I can really do is do these one at a time. What I can say is that I put an enormous amount of effort and time into these videos. And there's a reason why all of my breakdowns are different from everyone else's. To try and figure out what it all means, like I'm not just pulling info from Genius, I'm studying the lyrics for hours and hours and hours, like a lot of time goes into this. With all that said, just a week ago, Kendrick Lamar dropped a six minute diss record towards Drake. And I really do appreciate anyone that waited for this video, the patience, like of I know what not. this moment is, of course. I can't do this twice, so I'm trying to do it right. All right, so first and foremost, the title, Euphoria. So much to unpack in this in itself. <laughs> in the title, yeah. So uh, what I know about the title, Euphoria, is one, it's the definition it says on the thing. Uh, you know, he's, he's elated, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm just happy. I'm just going to demolish you here. Also, Euphoria is a show that um, notoriously sexualizes teenagers that um, Drake executively produced. So that's great. Um, that dropped on 616. So, you know, references, as we're going to get to that eventually. Um, and also, I know this right here, um, the second definition, it says, They almost had a week to recover from the euphoria of two-day series winning victory. This dropped on a Tuesday, and then almost a week later is when 616 and Meet the Grams dropped on the same day. So, I think it's, yeah, big foreshadowing there, which I really like. Now, as you guys know, on Drake's track, Taylor Made, he said that he was expecting a quintuple entendre from Kendrick due to his delay. You better have a motherfucking quintuple entendre on that shit. Some shit I don't even understand. And Kendrick did that in the title, and then some. Now, before I break down all oh, the shit. meanings of this title, go. I want to point out the true hidden meanings first, which everyone has missed, and it is quite literally a large part of the entire premise and setup of this record. Uma Thurman from Kill Bill recently tagged Drake in a post on Instagram offering him the iconic suit where she <laughs> fends off multiple opponents. Now, the objective of her character is that of revenge. That's funny. She is quite literally trying to kill Bill. 
However, there is a scene in the series where Bill claims that she is a liar who is not just incapable of telling the truth about him, but telling the truth to herself. Because when it comes to the subject of me, I believe you are truly and utterly incapable of telling the truth, especially to me, and least of all to yourself. To address his issues with her law, I mean, Drake brings that up basically. He does that, basically that scene to Drake in uh, Meet the Grams. As Bill shoots her with a dart containing a serum called the Undisputed Truth and states that the serum will cause a state of euphoria. Gotcha. <laughs> what lies within that dart is an incredibly potent and quite infallible truth serum. I call it the Undisputed Truth. With no druggy after effects, except for a uh, slight Bill. wave of euphoria. And that is quite mm -hmm. literally the setup of how Kendrick approaches this record by presenting what he feels to be non-stop, undisputed truths about Drake. It is in this track. Wow, yeah, I've never seen anyone catch that. That's really, that's insane. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that makes a lot of sense with her posting that to the Instagram story and everything. Track and the upcoming tracks where you will see Kendrick paints Drake as a liar, as an actor, as someone that lies to himself, and just like Bill in this movie, yeah. Kendrick does not believe a word that Drake says. However, mm. in the very first line of this track, Kendrick makes reference to superpowers getting neutralized, which is the exact same the exact thing same that thing. Bill yeah. talks about in the same scene of this movie. Is there's the superhero and there's the alter ego. Batman is actually Bruce Wayne. Spider-Man is actually Peter Parker. When that character wakes up in the morning, he's Peter Parker. He has to put on a costume to become Spider-Man. That character is... That's really... I've never seen this uh, breakdown before. People catching this, yeah. Because this scene really does make a lot of sense in the context of the battle. The way he's bringing it up. like He's, literally, he's like recreating this scene of diss track form. That's super creative and amazing. Superman stands. Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. When Superman wakes up in the morning, he's Superman. His outfit with the big red S. That's the blanket he was wrapped in as a baby when the Kents found him. Those are his clothes. Bill describes the alter ego of superheroes who require a costume to become that character. This is exactly what Kendrick does in most of his record as he strategically picks Drake's character apart. Bill then goes on to point out that Superman is always Superman. When he wakes up in the morning, he does not have a character. He was born Superman. Now, as we move further into this track, and, and Kendrick, I guess Kendrick can compare himself that he is Superman, you know, because he doesn't have to put on the front to act like it, you know? As Kendrick alludes to Drake being a fraud, Kendrick is saying that when it comes to hip hop, he is Superman. He was born this person, in the culture that Drake impersonates with no need for a mm -hmm. costume. So when Kendrick refers to superpowers becoming neutralized, he is essentially saying that in this track and in this war, he is removing the costume from Drake to expose his true identity. And speaking of beef, let me tell you about today's sponsor, well, Cook Unity. Cook Unity. Shout out for getting sponsors. Actually, no, we are watching your video, so I will play the sponsor. You can skip. He is the first yeah. chef to consumer platform we're, delivering we're freshly video, so prepared, we'll pre selected meals now. right to your door weekly. And there is a few different subscription plans for you to pick. Choosing one of Cook Unity's subscription plans is quick, easy, and effortless. And once you're all set up, you will start to receive restaurant quality, fully cooked meals. So all you have to do is heat it up and you're ready to eat and enjoy. So maybe you don't have time to cook for yourself, or maybe maybe you just want to break throughout the week, haul out a quick meal, good option. You will select from hundreds of meals each week prepared by award-winning chefs, and if you can't or don't have time, Cook Unity is happy to select your meals based on your taste preferences. So basically you'll just let them know what types of foods you like, and they'll tailor your meals around that. The meal plans are flexible and commitment-free, you could skip deliveries, it pause or cancel hungry, anytime, and enjoy restaurant quality meals for a fraction of the price. Subscriptions start at as low as $11 per meal. And if you want to subscribe and get some meals from Cook Unity, all you have to do is go to cookunity.com dirt50 
or click the link in the description below the code, and use my code DIRT50 to get 50% off your first order. And thank you again to Cook Unity for sponsoring this video. Now on to the other meanings behind the title. The track is titled Euphoria. We're over six minutes into the video, we're still in the title. We're nearly as much far as the track is long and we're still in the fucking title. That's how you know how deep this shit goes. <laughs> and the artwork gives a clear definition of what that means. Secondly, the artwork then also provides an example of the word euphoria being used in an actual sentence where it states, they had almost a week to recover yeah, from was, the euphoria of Tuesday's series winning victory, and Kendrick dropped the track on a Tuesday, alluding to how this record is giving him a win, also a reference to his upcoming tracks as well. Furthermore, Drake executive produced the hit show Euphoria, a show right. depicting the lives of teenagers who find themselves in very adult-like situations. God. <laughs> Therefore, this reference is also clearly with respect to the ongoing rumors that Drake is into much younger women. However, the title right. is even more deeper than that. I'm talking about the studied... <laughs> he implies that more and more with every diss track he dropped. ...phenomenon where people experience a state of euphoria before they die. This is by far the most strategic <laughs> like use that. of the title, nice. as this is exactly what happened to Drake. Euphoria is in every sense of the word a bait track. Look at how confident Drake was. Like, Kendrick fucking knew. He had all those <laughs> records recorded. Done, ready, waiting. Kendrick knew... Yeah, he recorded He recorded a, a 10 songs in one sitting, in one studio session, and then just, just changed them a little bit as the new tracks came out then to release them. Insane work. ...that Drake felt he had a slam dunk in his beef. He knew that when Drake dropped the Family Matters track, that Drake would have been living on a high, feeling like he won leaving Drake in a state of euphoria. However, just like when people experience euphoria moments before they die, this is exactly what Kendrick did to Drake, strategically releasing a showstopper record just moments after Drake dropped. And look, you don't have... Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, so this released Tuesday, and then it was Thursday. Literally... Was it no... Hold up. No, it was a Saturday, wasn't it? That, uh... Because, I know, because before he dropped on Tuesday, I think it was Saturday, that all hell broke loose. And, uh... So, and then Kendrick dropped 6.16 in L.A. in the morning. At 6.16 in, in L.A. time. Um, and then to bait Drake more into dropping the diss track, and then he clicks the red button, and he, um, releases, uh... Family Matters, and then like 20 minutes later, he releases Meet the Grams, and it just completely shuts him down. Then the next day, he drops Not Like Us, the song of the summer. So, I mean, like, yeah, and then Drake is forced to release The Heart Part 6 the day after. Um, actually, no, I think it was Friday that the Family Matters, uh, Meet the Grams stuff happened. And then, yeah, so, and then Sunday, late Sunday, he drops The Heart Part 6, which is just the worst diss track <laughs> I've ever heard had to believe me but i had this as a prediction in this script before any of those records even came out i truly made the connection that drake would experience a great deal of euphoria from that release only to have it taken away by kendrick and it sucks that i couldn't get the video out in time but seeing it all come true <laughs> well, yeah, really yeah, like just lets days. me know that all the time and effort that i put into this shit really does hold some weight so this was literally all part of his plan the long wait, the being quiet, like making Drake believe that he had the upper hand. Said he's Strategy, worried, man. chess. Mm. Fucking phenomenal. With the title out of the way, I've seen some theories bouncing around that are trying to support the claims of Drake being involved with younger women through the use of the date that the record dropped, April 30th, also known as National Children's Day. <laughs> it's a holiday in Mexico, like not, it's not an American holiday. I, I don't see the significance. Then we got the theory of funny, Kendrick though. holding back the record to drop it on the date that the funny mustache man was killed. <laughs> and give The funny mustache man is crazy. Yeah, I've seen this one too. <laughs> if he intended that, that's insane. Even the fact that Drake is of that faith, people seem to think that something is also here. It doesn't make any sense. Like, the, the funny mustache man, when he died, that was like one of the best things to ever happen for that religion. 
quite literally the ending of suffering. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Outside of the date... Yeah, it is the opposite. It'd, be, it'd make more sense if it was a Kanye diss track. <laughs> the time that the record dropped was 8.24 p.m., which is an ode to Kobe Bryant, who wore the number... <laughs> dropping, dropping a diss track 8 a.m. on a Thursday... No, 8 a.m. on a random Tuesday is just so nuts. <laughs> I mean, that's pure hatred right there. Numbers 8 and 24. Euphoria's glorified and made his. That one does make sense. So we looked at the title, we looked at the date, the time, now let's look at the beat selection. Structurally, the track is broken up into three parts with three different beats, which is del- He can and like, yeah, and like that, he said, I bought him with, I hope they come with three switches. Um, which obviously switches guns and all, but also he, he, he then literally comes with three beat switches. Liberate and very clever, as Kendrick plays off- which I think Drake also, because uh, Family Matters was definitely made before Euphoria, it just came out after. Um, well, it was partially made, they obviously had to change some stuff, like obviously they referenced a lot of the, some of the lines in Euphoria in Family Matters, but I think the whole thing, of, I think Drake also came up with the three B-switches thing, he was like, oh, I came with three switches, I'm gonna do three B-switches, but Kendrick got to it first. So, yeah. One of his hardest lines from like that. I hope they come with three switches, and then he comes with three switches. Like, that's that's tough. The first beat is important for me to mention, as Kendrick samples a track from Teddy Pendergrass called You're My Latest, My Greatest Inspiration. More beautiful than the Mona Lisa. Now, I've seen some outrageous rumors being spread that Teddy Pendergrass had previous allegations of messing with kids that are not Whoa. only completely unsubstantiated, but documented absolutely nowhere. While my primary focus is breaking down this record, in doing this, I feel obligated to point out things that are just blatantly untrue. And look, I know Teddy had his- Just, just slander and random people. Fair share of scandals, but to just be pulling this information out of your ass and throwing it up online, especially when it comes to claims like this, like, you should probably stop doing that. However, interestingly enough, Teddy covered a song by Drake's uncle Larry Graham, who is a Hall of Fame inducted musician. Yeah, so Larry Graham, I know, he does, he, he samples a song where he's like playing the guitar, where Drake's uncle's playing the guitar, I think it was in a, I think it was in 616, or was it, meet the, it was either that or Meet the Grams, I'm pretty sure it was 616. Yeah. Now, you can best believe that this is not a coincidence and there's a deeper meaning behind the use of this sample. I'm just unclear of what that could be. Outside of that, Teddy Pendergrass did get in a car accident which left him paralyzed in a wheelchair, just yeah. like the character that Drake played <laughs> on Degrassi. And Drake's uncle okay, has an accolade on, that is better than any award or plaque, any of that shit. Like, he's known for inventing... The slap technique at a base. Like, that is crazy, bro. That's Kendrick crazy. starts that, out the... That is crazy. That's a very popular technique. What the fuck? Track with a small intro that has an... Ex Everybody they say about me is true. I'm a phony. Excerpt played in reverse. And that's a... It's from a movie. It's reverse from a movie that stars Michael Jackson as well. From the 1978 film The Wiz. Euphoria. The film reimagines the 1900 novel and 1939 film The Wizard of Oz in the perspective of African Americans. Kendrick uses this oh, yeah. I didn't know about all that. to oh. symbolize that what he's about to craft is for the culture, something he believes Drake simply isn't a part of. He really hmm. drives this home as in the context of this movie, Kendrick is comparing Drake to the wizard who is played by Richard Pryor. Pryor's wizard is initially looked at as someone who is feared and respected. He uses technology and trickery to maintain his illusion of power, but is soon discovered to be a fraud. This goes back to Kendrick and removing the costume from Drake's character. The wizard is exposed when the blanket is pulled back, revealing- <laughs> Can we talk about how we're like five seconds into the track, by the way? We're like, we've only covered like the first two lines. We're 12 minutes into the video. Uh, this is just, dude, this is such a crazy that he's not powerful. analysis. Yeah, this is proof that I think Kendrick Lamar has got to be, like, one of the most smartest human beings just on the planet. Just one of the most creative wordsmiths ever. I mean, it's just insane. Like, how the hell do you think of all this shit? Like, <laughs> and to make it in, like, le in like a month at most. I mean, it's just, and, to make, and then to make it as the first part of ten diss tracks you recorded. Like, I don't understand how it's physically possible, dude. Like, got to be one of the most creative minds ever. <laughs>
helpful at all. I'm sorry. Everything they say about me is true. I'm a phony. I got no powers. I got no right to be pretending to be the wizard. Much like the wizard, Kendrick looks at Drake as someone who uses industry connections, fame, collaborations, fashion, hairstyle, <laughs> and even technology like social media. Yeah, basically everything about um, the title to the first lines of the song. You're just trying to print up the picture of, of he's a phony. He's trying to fit into the culture and he's not really a part of it. And he's just trying to blend in. To fool people into believing that he is a person of the culture. Everything they say about me is true. When brought back to its original form, the line is extremely important to the overall theme of this record. Everything they say about me is true, the key word being they. As you'll see later in this record, Kendrick does not present much new information with respect to Drake, mostly reciting pre-existing things that... Yeah, he's just trying to, it's just, in this track he was more reinforcing that all the things that have been said about him, all the negative things were true, and just trying to go after everything that already, had already been said before in the next track he goes after all the new information with, you know, his daughter and more of the sex ring pedophile shit, whatever the hell he was going for, yeah. People have already said, within the culture, aka, things that they said. By not exposing anything new, many people took this as a weakness but this is quite literally Kendrick's entire strategy record. Basically, Kendrick is demonstrating that Drake has been exposed so many times that he doesn't even need to reveal anything new <laughs> yeah. as he packages all the already existing info and presents it as being more than enough to remove Drake's costume. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, you know. If there's just, she's like the first person to put everything of these allegations and everything that's been said about him into the one song, like, bully go, hey, bro, here's the full picture of everything that they've already said, you know. I don't even need to say anymore. And this is, like, it's already out there before you get hit with the new information a few days later. So it's critical to point out that in the phrase, everything they say about me is true, the term they is representing the culture that is hip hop. So all that right there is the framework and entire setup of the theme of this record. Literally. Another obvious meaning behind Kendrick's choice of quoting The Wiz is the fact that it is an African-American cult classic, which is likely what Kendrick watched as a child. Whereas someone like Drake, growing up with a white mother, probably <laughs> only watched the original Wizard of Oz, which had no black actors whatsoever. I mean, I've never seen, I've never seen The Wiz. I've never seen The Wiz. Kendrick starts out the disc claiming that Drake's superpowers have been neutralized while he watches in silence. Circling back to the Kill Bill reference, as I've stated already, superpowers being neutralized alludes to Drake's costume being removed, exposing the fraud beneath it. The line about watching in silence perfectly ties into the quote from The Wiz, where Kendrick is essentially saying that he doesn't even need to speak, all he needs to do is sit back in silence, as Drake's alter ego unravels right. by itself through everything that they, the culture, says about him. DMX pointed out years ago... I think this is already... I think Euphoria, because what I already know and what the more stuff he's already told me in the first 14 minutes of this video, where he hasn't even gone off for the second line of the song yet, um, <laughs> I think this is one of the most well-written songs I've ever heard in my entire life. Like, obviously, I haven't heard... We're going to go on the hip-hop journey. We're going to go through a lot of these things and music in general. But this is one of the most well-written songs I've ever seen in my entire life. And its sole purpose was to just take down this one dude. <laughs> Drake was a fraud. Meek Mill exposed Drake for ghostwriters. Pusha T exposed Drake for being in blackface. <laughs> DMX, yeah. I don't like the way he looks. You know, I don't like the way he dress. You know, I don't like the way he walks. And that gets brought up again by Kendrick later. And hiding a child. Joe Bud... Yeah, all these, uh, all these allegations get brought up. And alluded to underage women claims. Rick Ross painted Drake as a cultural outsider that had plastic surgery. Tupac's estate disapproved of Drake's use of an AI Tupac, and over the years, the culture in itself has added even more into the mix. When it comes to Drake and the culture that is hip-hop, the people within it have already neutralized Drake's superpowers on their mm. own. You'll also notice that everything I just mentioned are all things that Kendrick makes reference to on this track. The famous actor we once knew is looking paranoid and now spiraling. So right off rip, in the second line, Kendrick begins to chip away at Drake's hip-hop persona. 
This line is not just directed at Drake for being an actor on the grassy, but as an actor within the culture that is hip hop. You're moving just like a degenerate, heavy antique is feeling distasteful. This line acts as a double entendre where one, Kendrick refers to Drake as a degenerate, likely due to his internet antics and the way that he moves in general. He seemingly- yeah. So Drake was doing all this trolling and then Kendrick pops back at him by doing trolling of his own with 616 trying to poke it on to make him drop he supports this further by labeling like, drake just like just like drake did with taylor mid freestyle and this is and it's proven more because 616 is produced by jack antonoff which is taylor swift's producer meaning it's literally taylor made takes ai dis as a distasteful cheap gimmick and secondly he is watching drake's career degenerate meaning to downgrade in terms of quality and how it's being perceived well, i calculate you not as calculated i can even predict your angles so first and foremost, Kendrick uses a play- And this is the, well, very well-aged line, because he literally does. Because he drops Family Matters, and then 20 minutes later, he drops Meet the Grams. I mean, he perfectly predicted everything. Like, <laughs> this track is like, uh, not Nostradamus, dude. It's like- <laughs> On words in a mathematic setting, referencing calculations and angles. Furthermore, he paints Drake as someone who is not as calculated as he might believe, claiming that he can predict his every move, which is exactly what he did. He predicted what Drake was gonna do on the Family Matters record. Fabricate stories on the family front cause you heard Mr. Morale. In the first line, Kendrick alludes to Drake, which he then does in Family Matters. So he perfectly, he says that, then he perfectly predicts Drake's angle in the next, in the next line. Seemingly suggesting on push-ups that Kendrick's wife might have been unfaithful. Kendrick addressed his infidelity on his previous project, and he is insinuating that Drake is pulling these claims out of his ass based on that <laughs> info. A pathetic master manipulator, how can smell the tales on you now? Kendrick is basically claiming that Drake is twisting the truth to fit a narrative that the masses will likely run with, and that he can already smell the bullshit coming. You're not a rap artist, you're a scam artist with the hopes of being accepted. Following the theme of the record, Kendrick continues to drive home that Drake yeah. is simply not the, the person who he appears to be. Now the whole theme is just, you're not the person you appear to be, you're wearing a mask, and you're pretending to be part of the culture. By claiming that Drake is desperate to be accepted, and that he fabricated a persona to make that happen. Drake claims he wasn't cool in high school. You know, it was, um, I just always felt like an outsider. I, I went, Tommy Hilfiger stood out, but FUBU never had been your collection. Kendrick right. claims that Drake is <laughs> r r the rich white company over the more, uh, you know, for the culture. Far company. more Tommy Hilfiger, a brand that is far more common in a white man's wardrobe. <laughs> Furthermore, allegations were made years ago that Tommy Hilfiger was racist, not approving of different ethnicities wearing his brand. For the oh, record, well. this has been proven not to be true but it was a narrative back in the day kendrick claims mm. that drake never had any fubu in his collection which is a masterful line in itself truly helping to drive home the approach with this record fubu is a black owned company with the slogan for us by us but more importantly fubu is very much a hip-hop company fubu the clothes got mass appeal they the best <laughs> that ever did it i'm just keeping it real what Kendrick is really trying to drive home here is that just like FUBU, hip-hop is a culture that is for the people, by the people, and that is something that Drake has no ties to, as he is an outsider. Kendrick mm. could also be referring to a fairly recent picture of Drake wearing FUBU, and I couldn't find any other pictures in existence where he's doing that. Now again, to be <laughs> fair, which I am, Drake posted a drawing that he did from when he was a kid. It was like a cat or something. And it was wearing a FUBU hat, so he obviously knew about the brand from a, from a young age. I make music that okay. electrify him. You make music that pacify him. Kendrick points out that his music electrifies people. What he means by this is his music requires people to think as the brain generates electrical activity right. when it processes thoughts. This disc record in itself... Yeah, pacify, you know, is relaxes people and also makes people go to sleep Elf is proof <laughs> of just how layered his music can get Kendrick creates music about real world issues in a very poetic way that involves a great deal of comprehension in the case of Drake he claims that he makes music that pacifies them now when we look at the definition of pacify it is to cause someone who is angry or upset to be calm and satisfied. This is very important because Kendrick makes music to unite and empower his people. 
As we've seen in the past, protesters literally use his lyrics to make a statement. When we look at the subject mm. matter in a lot of Drake's music, he is making the people do the opposite, calming them down by not evoking much thought at all, making them happy and pacifying them. And this line again went over heads, like people were thinking that he was calling Drake's music sleepy, like that that's not what that means. It's way deeper than that. However, the line also offers well, up another meaning, feeding into the claims of Drake being involved with younger women, as pacify could be in reference to a pacifier. This is further supported by Kendrick claiming that he could double down on the line, but in this case, he spared him. No, you're a master manipulator and habitual liar too. Kendrick then, for the second time, calls Drake a master manipulator, and just like in the Kill Bill reference from earlier, he claims that Drake is a habitual liar. You are truly and utterly incapable of telling the truth, especially to me. It's a genius chess move because he gave himself a, a bit of a safety net. And now we've been hearing the people talk like, oh, Drake's a liar. Kendrick, Kendrick said he was going to lie. That's what he's doing. He then makes reference to his own lyrics from the heart part four. But don't tell no lie about me and I won't tell <laughs> truths about you. Don't tell a lie. Such a such an insane line, dude. Such a great line to end up to put right before the beat drop and then... And yeah, once again, Nostradamus. He fully went with it. <laughs> um, yeah, perfectly predicted what was going to happen. He, he told him. He told him. <laughs> this is another really clever reference, as many believe that it was on that track where Kendrick took aim at both Big Sean and Drake. The key word being truths, plural. Like, I, I have more than one thing on you. Kendrick then hits Drake with a nasty beat switch. I love this beat so much. When I'm driving in the car and like this beat drops, my foot just gets real heavy on the gas. Like I'll start, <laughs> I start speeding. Such a head bumper. Kendrick plays into the narrative that Cole and Drake cultivated on their discs that Kendrick is laying low and not selling as well as he used to. The line is also a reference to mm. Kendrick being low in terms of his height, which is something that Drake <laughs> continues to play on. He ain't thinking about no reaper, nigga, I'm reaping what I sow, okay? So, as I said before, there was no way that J. Cole was coming to edit this thing on Skade, and Kendrick proves this to be correct, as he has some more bars for Cole here. I don't think any of us could forget J. Cole's verse on Johnny P's Caddy. It was in this verse where mm. J. Cole really started to reach. Ooh, it's a nice flip on that because reaping what he sows, um, you know, J. Cole didn't really reap what he sowed because he, you know, he said stuff and then immediately took it back. Shaped the narrative of who was the best, and Kendrick takes the chance to flip one of Cole's hardest lines. To make it clear that J. Cole is not the Reaper, and unlike Cole who apologized, Kendrick was going to follow through in his beef, reaping what he sowed. I said this two months ago. I thought that J. Cole was taking shots at Kendrick on Johnny P's caddy. I do think he is talking to someone, and that someone, I feel like, is Kendrick Lamar. And Kendrick thought the same thing. I mean, there's a reason why he's referencing that record in particular. He got a Benjamin and a Jackson all in my house like I'm Joe K. So Kendrick really starts to put his Drop pen on so display. Hard. He makes reference to Benjamins and Jacksons, alluding to how he has plenty of money. This is likely a rebuttal to Drake's claims on push-ups regarding Kendrick's contract splits. However, the line is also in reference to Joe J Yeah, so we got... Yeah, it's got Benjamin and Jackson, like uh, Jackson and his pet mouse, you know, fucking Ben, he made a song about. And uh, he's also <laughs> saying he's Joe, which means he's the father, which one is the double, because obviously Joe would have these in his house. But also, he's saying that he's Joe Jackson, which would make him the father of Michael Jackson, which is who Drake's claiming to be. And, um, yeah, and also, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jackson, who is Michael Jackson's father, and it's interesting to note that Michael Jackson also had a pet rat named Ben. Michael Jackson was weird from the jump. In this beef, the Michael Jackson and Prince thing just- All types of weird pets. Uh, rats, um, monkeys, camels. This gets flipped and rebuttaled over and over again. I love the every track having the rebuttal to the MJ Prince lines. I thought that was like such a fun part of the beef. 
And in this case, he's either calling Drake a rat or someone in his team a rat or both. There are multiple layers to this line alone. Kendrick brings up the Hellcat, which is a sports car trim for Dodge, but also by definition, a Hellcat is a spiteful, violent woman. Kendrick cleverly plays with the word hell, making it seem that Drake and his associates all sold their soul while simultaneously calling Drake a bitch. But in the next line, there's even more layers. Everybody nice. wanna be demon till they get chipped by your throwaway. Kendrick can demon preacher's name. <laughs> can use the clever wordplay with his usage of the word demon, as the demon is a trim level above the Hellcat for Dodge cars. The use of the word chipped refers to the demon being chipped out so that it has specific programming tailored to its performance. Kendrick also uses the word demon as a play on Future's middle name, Demon, and references one of Future's tracks, Throwaway. Go and pet that puppy, get it over with. I always change the lyrics and sing that song to my dog. And being chipped by a throwaway is also a ref. That was a random cute fun fact there. Reference to being taken out by a gun, as when you commit a crime with a pistol, you throw away the piece to eliminate any evidence. Furthermore, being chipped by a throwaway is also in reference to Kendrick's track Like That, which is what yeah. sparked this entire thing. And what's even more nuts is that the every, I'm pretty sure damn near every line in this song is at least a double entendre. Like, it's fucking insane. Like That track was Future's record, the guy that he already referenced within the line. Kendrick is essentially saying that the verse that shook the world was a throwaway verse, it was effortless, and it was nothing for him to do. However, while on the topic of future and throwaways, a throwaway is also a woman that you just hit and toss to the side, and as we all know, future accused Drake of pillow talking, so it's very possible that the woman that Drake trusted to share secrets with was one of future's throwaways, so therefore, he right, right. got chipped by a throwaway. But the line is even crazier than that. I need you guys to remember Drake. It feels like every line, I'm like, hey, we finally got everything to this line. They're very nice. And he goes, wait a minute. There's actually a seventh meaning. It's like, brother, what? <laughs> Drake's recent track with J. Cole called Evil Ways, as it was on that track where Cole had subliminals for Kendrick. I stay out of beef. See niggas' DNA get rearranged. I'm and to make this even more obvious, it's on that exact same track where J. Cole claims that he is going through his demon phase. Young Angel going through his demon phase. So when Kendrick says everybody want to be a demon until they get chipped by a throwaway, that's a bullet for both Drake and J. Cole. In the case of Drake, nice. he ended off his push-ups track by claiming not to wake the demon up. This ain't even everything I know don't wake the demon up. Oh yeah, I, that's an obvious reference. I can't believe we didn't catch that one. In the case of J. Cole, he claimed to be in his demon phase, but quite literally got chipped by a throwaway when he got entirely bent at his shape and apologized for his diss that Kendrick didn't even yeah. open his mouth for and then proceeded <laughs> to delete it. J. Cole's diss was a throwaway. He fucking deleted it. Everyone clowned him for it. You got chipped by a throwaway. Everybody want to be demon till they get chipped by your throwaway. This is extremely high level writing. Like that line is fucking nuts. <laughs> and I might do a show with that. Insane. So many fucking meanings. Goddamn. Hey, what's a lame? Always a lame. In the first line, Kendrick claims that he might do a show a day, possibly referencing J. Cole's diss when he said this. And he's still doing shows, but fell off like the Simpsons. The Simpsons has 765 episodes, and still to this day, TV channels are playing their episodes daily. Kendrick is claiming that like the Simpsons, he could also do a show every single day, and likely even sell it out. So I'm hoping you guys can see the theme now the in verse show. 1, where these last chunk of lines weren't just directed at Drake, but, but J. Cole as well. Oh, you thought the money the power Yeah, I didn't realize how much J. Cole got, got more heat in this. Oh, a fame will make you Drake and also, it's also, I have to say this, Drake and, Drake and J. Cole have just gotten, but uh, Drake and J. Cole have dropped like their worst songs of all time after this beef. Like they've been completely shook by this beef. We got fucking J. Cole out here, drippy, drippy. Grippy. <laughs> and fucking Drake, whatever the fuck that Hey There Delilah remix was. What the fuck was that? So yeah, I, don't <laughs> I just thought we'd mention that. Go away. The next sequence of lines is directed at Drake, claiming that Drake has always been a loser 
And even after Dang. all the money, power, and fame, he's still the same person. The line is also a callback to his verse on Like That, where instead of the word fame, he uses the word respect. B-O-T, the money, power, respect. The last one is better. Kendrick deliberately changes the words to reference Drake's confusion of thinking that fame amounts fame. to respect. When That's a really, I like that. That's a very creative thing to change in the one word to show the difference between the two people. When in fact they are two different things. Have you ever played? Have you ever? Okay, nigga, let's play. Kendrick then goes into a game of have you ever, but I also see this approach as Kendrick framing the questions somewhat like a therapy session. Have you ever watch your enemy down like with a poker face? Kendrick's reason for doing this is to highlight the cultural differences between them. Imagine Drake and Kendrick are playing a game of Have You Ever, where the questions are all about things Kendrick witnessed or was directly involved with growing up. Drake probably wouldn't have much to say because he can't relate to Kendrick's experiences. Have you ever right. paid 500 thou, like to an open case? In the second line, he- Yeah, 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 this is something that- I'm, I'm surprised I didn't hear about before the beef. That this, this, is, this just never got brought up. Glad Kendrick brought this up. He alludes to Drake having to pay $500,000 to a woman that accused him of sexual assault. And I know the article says 350 k but when you transfer that into our shitty Canadian dollar, it's pretty close. I hate when I rap or talk about guns, then somebody die, they turn into nuns. Again, there are a lot of cultural references layered within this track, and Kendrick's approach to lines like this one is to point out the stark differences between himself and Drake. Kendrick has spoken on gun violence in his music before, and does it in a way that is very tactful, pushing to influence change. When we look at an artist like Drake, while he does have some lines that speak on gun violence in a way that could be helpful, he has far more gun-related bars that do the opposite. Then when we look at some of the alleged right. crimes that are connected to Drake and his inner circle, which could be a whole other video in itself, Kendrick oh, is essentially painting Drake as someone that really doesn't care to make any strides towards change, and that when he does speak up, it's more of a PR move. Then hop online, like pray for my city, he faking for likes and digital hugs. Passed down by elders, people don't even know about the people don't even know the logistics of, of the beef or everybody got a stick, we don't run faith. And look, guys, like uh, there is a theory out there that's claiming these lines are directed at Jay Prince and the death of Takeoff, and that's pretty heavy shit. I don't, you guys already know, I don't do that type of content on the channel. Uh, I just kind of keep it to the music. Mm. Is Daddy a killer? He wanna be junior. They must have forgot the shit that they done. To All right, so this line is fucking insane, and everyone missed some key references. First off, this is yeah, a the line is still going after the Drake wearing a mask. Dot towards so Drake's line. actual father, Dennis. Unlike his brother Larry Jr., who had a very successful music career, Drake's dad's career was far more lackluster. So when Kendrick says that he wanted to be like Jr., it's obvious that Dennis wanted a career that was as successful as his older brother, but that just didn't happen. To add the cherry on top, Drake's grandfather, who went by Larry Sr., was also a musician, so Larry Jr. quite li Literally talking about his entire family here, literally going through the whole lineage, dude literally took the reins and not Dennis. Then when we look at the fact that Drake's dad has literally tried to ignite his own career by piggybacking off Drake's success, it makes even more sense. Even on his official Fuck. website, the promotions are not even tagged as Dennis Graham, but as Drake's dad. You gotta hit the like button for that one, come on. The next reference was also missed by pretty much I everyone. I and didn't know was going after his dad there. The fact that oh. I watched The Sopranos in full at least 10 times, I caught this one right away. Now you're gonna listen to me, Christopher. This is a fucking business. Sorry, that's just my favorite show. In The Sopranos, just like his father before him, Tony wanted to be the boss and overtake his Uncle Junior's place. The line about forgetting shit that they say is a reference to Uncle Junior, who constantly begins to forget everything and eventually develops dementia, which is something that Kendrick mentions in the very next line. Drop a comment. Oh, yeah. Nice. For me, come on. Thirdly, Kendrick refers to Birdman as Drake's dad, as he was signed under him for cash money, and Birdman does have a slew of allegations with respect to being a killer. There's quite uh -huh. a few of cash money artists who have just... And we get back to the cash money thing later, when you were signed to it, you were signed to it, that was signed to it. Mysteriously been murdered. So, in the Birdman scenario, the reference uh -huh. to Junior is with respect to Lil Wayne, 
who once literally called Birdman his dad, and of course Drake took a lot of influence from Wayne, more or less aspiring to be just like him. But there's even more to it than that, that's not it. The last reference is to Texas hip-hop legend Jay Prince, someone that Drake considers his mob ties, and in this context, Junior refers to his son, Jay Prince Jr. The line is fucking nuts. Like, it's 16 words that give you four deep meanings that are all very relevant. It, it's a crazy line. The very first time I shot me a Drake, the homie had told me to aim it this way. This line is one of the more surface level bars. Kendrick is referring to shooting a Draco, which is a Drake, gun, but also Drake, sounds like Drake's name, duh. like he's shooting Drake. I didn't point down enough. Today I show you I learned from those mistakes. Lastly, he claims that he needs to aim the gun down, which is in reference to Drake being beneath him. Somebody had told me that you got a ring on God. The, yeah, flip on uh, how Drake was saying Kendrick is below him by one not making like 20 million short bars, but also going, uh, just to have this talk with you, I had a hike down. I'm ready to double the wage. Drake purchased Tupac's custom diamond ring at an auction for over $1 million. Now, Kendrick being from the West Coast and a huge fan of Pac, claims he's willing to buy it back from Drake for double the price, just so it's not in his possession. And it's very possible that Drake bought that ring just to be petty. Very possible. It is a pretty mm. clever line because by saying that Pac would turn in his grave over the ring, Kendrick is also insinuating that Pac would have been pissed and would have never approved of Drake's AI gimmick. Cut the finish, oh, yeah, I'll twist it. <laughs> what is it, the brakes? So again... <laughs> Absolutely iconic line. More cultural references here as Kendrick continues to chip away at Drake, pegging him as an outsider in the culture. Kendrick asks Drake if he has shit twisted, alluding to Drake's new hairstyle, which is indeed braided. He confirms this even more with the next line when he says, what is it, the braids? Something that I've grown to accept over the years is, what is, it, the, the, braids? is the fact that I'm never going to have braids, you know? <laughs> and now, a tough pill to swallow. But I feel like Drake's braids are just too tight. But he's not just talking about Drake's hairstyle, but his own. Kendrick has been known to rock braids himself and uses this as a reference and cultural construct to highlight just how rooted he is to the culture. Braids are an integral part of black and African culture. The tradition has been passed down through generations to celebrate and honor one's ancestral roots. And most of you guys know this know, stuff like already, part. but trust me, there are people watching this that don't know. Like, they don't know that at one point, people were losing their jobs left, right, and center for just natural black hair. So, and it still happens today. Mm. I've seen lawsuits in recent years of, of it still happening, unfortunately. It was in the 1960s where braids and natural hair became a huge thing during the black power movement. It was quite literally used as a statement and as an expression against white supremacy and anti-blackness. So, in the case of Drake as it pertains to this line, Kendrick is painting him as being jealous and envious of what he represents culturally. The braids are only used to reference Kendrick's own identity and his deep-seated roots to African American culture, something that Drake wishes he had and attempts to emulate. He continues to drive this home by claiming that Drake doesn't want to work with him anymore, and it all ties perfectly into the overall theme of this record to further support Drake. I love the flow and how he says those lines in that part. What is it? The braids hurt your feelings. You don't work with me no more. Okay. It's longing for acceptance, but never fully getting it. What is it? The braids? Yeah. It's yeah. It's the overarching theme of the whole thing. Hurt your feelings. You don't work with me no more. Okay. Everyone that I've seen cover this, like this went over their heads. They were claiming that this line was about Drake's braids only, but it's a, it's a far deeper cultural reference than that. Like he's referring to himself in the context of African-American culture and what that represents. And again, he's removing the mask from Drake. Like the braids for Drake is part of the costume. Lastly, the line is most definitely in reference to Kendrick's control verse, where Drake claimed that he didn't want to work with Kendrick after the disc dropped. Does it make you, like, not want to collab with him? Yeah, I don't, I'm good right now, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just about this album and me, and, <laughs> you know, I don't know necessarily if I feel, like, 100%, like, I'm not like, man, send me some, let's work. Like, nah, not really, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, there's three ghosts left, and I see two of them kissing and hugging on stage. Again, J. Cole catches some bullets along with... <laughs> J. Cole is getting so many strays. We <laughs> did not want to get involved in this at all. Drake, 
Kendrick makes reference to the big three first person shooter and Drake and J. Cole's tour that they did where they literally hugged on stage. And he's also talking about how they act when they bring each other on stage, like as a guest, where J. Cole will be like, Trizzy Drake is in the building, way better than me. This guy's way better than me. And then Drake will be like, I got the goat in the building, J. Cole, his pen, I can't fuck with, way better than me. And like Kendrick's just like, what the fuck? Like, I'm not on that type of time. I don't know what these guys are doing. <laughs> I love them to death, and then eight bars, I'll explain their phrase. <laughs> I love this uh, thing where he says in eight bars, he explains the phrase, and then he literally does in eight bars. I love that. I really like this line. He claims to love Drake and J. Cole to death, but then proceeds to tell them that he's going to elaborate more on that in the next eight bars. It's not nobody can tell me. I don't want to talk on no celly. <laughs> Personally, with this one, I believe he is talking directly to J. Cole, who felt extremely bad about his diss and very likely tried to make contact with Kendrick to try to smooth things over. I mean, Kendrick is... <laughs> He's talking about who he can't sleep. People are saying he's seen Kendrick in his nightmares. Like, ah, ah, no, I'm not K-Dot. He's in war mode. Like, he's not trying to hear all that right now. He's in a different space. But I think they will end up coming together in the near future. And we're finally gonna get some music from these guys together. You know I got language barriers. There's no accent you can sell me. At this point, we have literally heard multiple accents from Drake. There's the UK Drake. Just like that one time at Cello, a good thing, man, we're pulling out phones. The UA Jamaican used Jafakin Drake. And more tune for your head top, so watch how you speak on my name, you know? Thing set the thing dead in, trust me. Jew Faken is so funny. <laughs> That's a word play right there. Then there's the Toronto accent Drake. You guys make me sick to my stomachs, fam. This didn't exist before we were here. Look around at the square, I promise you right now. Then we got the Caucasian Drake. Just one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. <laughs> Scrabble champion. Uh, Is she just, really? Yeah, she's just, uh, she's a top shelf lady. The New York Drake. I try and show out with none of the study. I don't I don't really do what other people do, like, for a true religion. I don't really do that stuff, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> Look, if you're confused, don't worry, because so am I. But here's how he actually talks right here. Ash, forget it. Look, can we just break up and get this over with? And people are going to say that I'm hating on Drake. I'm not hating on Drake. I'm a massive fan of Drake. But you can't so deny accents, that these things exist. Like, this is what <laughs> Kendrick's talking about, is it not? It was Joe Budden that actually said the exact same thing in one of his disses towards Drake. Say Canadian, maybe Asian, Croatian, be sounding like it's Jamaican friends, depend on what's shady in. And look, God damn, the rhyme scheme on that was insane. We're going to talk about writing and punchlines and quotables and personals. Like, this this diss track from Joe was one of the best Drake disses that we've seen. Yeah, Cole and Aubrey know I'm a selfish nigga. The crown is heavy. So again, notice he calls him Aubrey. That is the theme. That's who he's talking to on the record, not Drake. Come yeah, he's trying to take back the Drake persona to get to Aubrey, which is, you know, we get to the uh, uh, Meet the Grams. He doesn't say like, Drake at all. He just calls him Aubrey. Coming off to like that track, Kendrick made it clear that he doesn't care about the big three and that he's down to ride solo with the crown. Now the crown to be specific has been something that all three of these guys have referenced in their music at one point or another. In the case of J. Cole. Aiming at a couple heads, bitch, I'm crown hunting. Ray at the top playing keep away with the crown. And no different for Drake. Take my crown to the grave, I'm on the crown king. They never told me when you get the crown, it's gonna take some getting used to. And it was in this line where Kendrick even quoted himself talking about the crown. Heavy is the head that chose to wear the crown. However, this moment in this era will act as the deciding factor on whose head the crown belongs on. <laughs> and I think it's pretty obvious uh, who it ended up with, with uh, the new J. Cole and Drake tracks releasing and how uh, the streaming numbers for the Drake diss tracks are doing in pretty much everyone's opinion and just the quality of everything. I mean, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> and Kendrick seems to understand the mission as there's no friends when it comes to his end goal. He really drives this home with the YNW Melly reference, where Melly was accused of murdering his own friend. I pray they my real friends. If not, I'm YNW Melly. What's and that's, and that's eight bars after. Also interesting to note is that YNW Melly took to Instagram a month ago to make claims that he felt Kendrick took shots at him on the Like That record. Crash out like fuck rap. This Melly Mel if I had to. I don't see the connection. Like, to me, this line is clearly about Melly Mel, but he does mention his name on this record. I don't like you popping shit at Pharrell for him. I inherit the beef. Yeah, fuck all that pushing pee. Let me see you push a T. Yeah. Drake sent obvious bar there. subliminal shots at Pharrell in 2023 
on Travis Scott's Meltdown. How do you get this Pharrell, dude? He produces like half of all music. <laughs> what, is he, what, is, what the hell does Pharrell do, man? Now, I'm not going to break down his shots towards Pharrell in this video because that will be off topic. But I do believe the true reason for the tension is because of Pharrell's production work on Pusha T's last album. So Pusha's last album had 12 tracks on it, and eight of them were produced by Pharrell. And it's one of my favorite albums of the last four or five years. Amazing album. Kendrick claims that he's got no issue inheriting the beef on Pharrell's behalf, telling Drake to stop pushing P, meaning leave Pharrell alone. The phrase is... Uh, I didn't even catch the double meaning of Push and P right there. That's nice. Also, of course, something that was popularized by Gunna through his hit record, Push and P. I'm Push P! However, the line holds even more depth as Drake referenced the phrase in a song himself. Steady Push and P, niggas Push and P, TSD. To explain a little better, the phrase Push and P basically means keeping a player, acting with integrity whilst staying successful. In this scenario, Kendrick tells Drake to forget about the integrity and hits Drake in a sore spot by bringing up his infamous loss to Pusha T. Drake allegedly had a career-ending red button disc for Pusha, to which J <laughs> Prince shut down as he said Drake was taking it too far. You know, my reasons for pulling the plug and having that conversation with him simply because it, it crossed the line of music. So in the case of this beef with Pusha, Drake... Yeah, he's like, well, why don't you just go at him? And then he goes to the letter, uh, you're better, you're better going to push a T than you are to me, which is really saying something because he lost to push a T so hard. More or less so took the hard. high road, maintaining integrity, which is technically push and P. However, I also <laughs> feel the words, let me see you push a T has a couple meanings. One, he's clowning Drake regarding his loss to Pusha and egging him on to clear up unfinished business. And two, he's asking Drake to push the red button on that track that he held back because of Jay Prince. Drake's been talking about his red button for a while. I, d I don't think he has one for Kendrick, but I think he has. I think he's got something for. Family Matters was the red button, dude. <laughs> it just wasn't. <laughs> button was broken, dude. For Kanye and Pusha. <laughs> You better have spinning again on him when you think about pushing me. Okay, going if you were to diss Kanye, it's just unfair. He has too much material to diss him about. <laughs> It'd just be unfair. He's Terrence Thorne, I'm Terrence Crawford. Yeah, I'm whooping feet. Again, Kendrick brings up Drake's unfinished business with Pusha T, alluding to the L that he took. He then uses Pusha's real name, Terrence Thornton, and while he does clearly acknowledge that Pusha is dope, he claims that he's a far more deadly competitor calling himself Terrence Crawford, who is an undefeated boxer. I found it pretty funny because in that clip of him training, Drake's music is playing in the background. Kendrick begins to warn Drake and recommend that he should keep... Yeah, this is uh, the more... The more like, hey, bro, <laughs> you want to back off, you know? If you don't, if you push that button, dude, you know... <laughs> You're gonna get hit, bro, and he does. He gets hit with a wombo combo, dude. Fucking, we the grams are not like us. Keep this battle light, but then he uses Gunna's reputation as a snitch to imply that Drake is an even bigger rat. This ain't been about critics, not about gimmicks, not about who the greatest is. Always been about love and hate. Now let me say I'm the biggest hater. Kendra claims that at this point, this thing is not even about who's the greatest. <laughs> It's about his hatred for Drake, which is exactly... <laughs> yeah, Kendrick is a grade-A hater. Like, if we're talking about all-time haters, he's got to be up there. What I said five months ago... Before I can never hate the way Kendrick does. <laughs> or any of this was even close to what we're seeing now. I've said it multiple times on this channel. Like, he just does not like Drake. Kendrick then goes into an all-out hate Drake rant. I hate the way that you walk, the way that you talk. I I love this part. Also, it's definitely a reference to uh, DMX. Hate the way that you dress. I so again, as I mentioned before, the theme of this record for Kendrick is to bring up things that other people in the culture have said. And in this case, he's referencing DMX's thoughts about Drake. Why don't you? Which is a uh, yeah, this is absolutely hilarious clip right here. Like Drake. I don't like anything about Drake. Mm -hmm. Mom, I don't like his voice. I don't, I don't like I don't like what he talks about. I don't. I don't. Talk. I be trying to I don't tell his like face. People. I don't like the way he walks like nothing. I don't care. I hate the way that you sneak this. If I catch flight, it's gonna be direct. We 
At first, this line confused me because Kendrick is known to sneak diss himself, but the more I thought about it, he says he hates the way that Drake sneak disses. When it comes to Kendrick and sending shots, his subliminals are usually caught by everyone right away as he makes it pretty mm. obvious who he's talking to. <laughs> However, in the case of Drake, he goes about it in an entirely different way where he sneak disses people to the point where only his intended target picks up on it. Kendrick likely despises mm. this approach because it limits being able to respond to where the people would even understand where it originated from. We hate the bitches you fuck cause they confuse themselves with real women. Kendrick then takes a shot at Drake for the women that he sleeps with. This is such a great portion of the song, dude. This entire song, this is arguably the best diss track of them all. Good terms, it's just, it's just so well written. And the, the beat switches are so good, and the, the flows, it's, just, it's, just, it's fucking perfect track, This could man. be in reference to him being involved with younger females, or the fact that Drake likely sleeps with the fakest, dumbest, self-absorbed women imaginable. And then notice I said we, it's not just me, I'm with the culture feeling. Very ruthless and direct line from Kendrick. <laughs> Ju yeah, just a very. That's yeah. That basically sums up the entire uh, main idea of the track. Just like the line from the Wiz, everything they say about me is true. And just like the Kill Bill theory, Kendrick is dishing out what he feels to be undisputed truths. I call it the undisputed truth. Now, when he says I'm what the culture feeling, it has two meanings. Where one. The culture agrees with what he's saying on this record, and two, the culture is literally feeling Kendrick as they have embraced him as the face to carry the genre. How many more fairy tale stories about your life till we had enough? How many more black features till you finally feel that? That line gets brought up in more detail during the, uh, uh, not like us with the whole uh, Atlanta, you know, colonizer comparison. Black enough. Kendrick starts to lay it on heavy and begins to deconstruct Drake's character. He references fairy tales about his life, which is most definitely regarding the subject matter of Drake's music over the years, where he tends to personify a tough guy act. He then questions Drake on how many black features does he need, which has a great deal of depth culturally. If we look at black art throughout history, the white man has been guilty of profiting, stealing, and claiming things as their own. Not only is Kendrick claiming that Drake hops from wave to wave to gain notoriety, he's strategically lumping him in with what is commonly mm. done by outsiders and executives who use people in the culture for their own benefit. On one of Joe Budden's disses to Drake, he broke this down really well. You leverage your celeb taking waves over that territorial takeover. So right away, this is exactly what Hell inside Joe Budden does. That shit sounds fire as hell. Kendrick's talking about. Maybe you think nobody notices. Gucci wasn't home two seconds before you wrote his dick. Gucci gets out of jail, Drake does a feature right away. Body Versace flows, copy the heat store. I else meal, sorry, Migo, Sadios, amigos. He hops on the Versace beat, copies that Migos flow. And then he doesn't work with the Migos till years later. Was that your plot all along? Why you ain't do that bit with Fetty, but you hopped in a song? No. So he did the song with Fetty, didn't do the video, and then he just ghosted him. Sound like a zombie on a trip. We're, we're, we're breaking on the Joe Budden disc right now. But yeah. It's because it's saying the same thing, basically, that Kendrick's saying. Bottom, it was zombie on a trip. No, who else started from the bottom? Zombie on a trip. How come after that joint, I don't see zombie on a trip? So, Mike Zombie is a producer that made the start it from the bottom beat, but after that track, Drake never worked with him again. He wasn't a well-known producer, and from what I can remember, Drake got the beat for an extremely cheap price. It's a story as old as time. Like, a lot of people have taken interest in black art, but then they take very little interest in the well-beings of the people who are making the art. And Joe made four different diss tracks towards Drake, and when all this beef Dang. goes down, I'm going to be breaking down those records because Joe was an amazing writer and he deserves mm. to have that highlighted. And the reason why Drake didn't respond to Joe is not because he wasn't worthy of a response. It was because he knew not to. He knew it was a bad idea. You gonna make a nigga bring back Puff. Let me see if Chubbs really crash something. Yeah, my first one, like my last one. It's a classic. You don't have one. Doesn't Kendrick Jay brings response. it back to when P. Diddy allegedly punched Drake in the face and claims he's about to do the same. He then mentions Drake's longtime friend and bodyguard Chubbs, who was likely with Drake the night that Diddy punched him, Can't and because it was Diddy, it. <laughs> he probably didn't do shit about it. Kendrick <laughs> then gets into the debate about classic albums, 
claiming that his first album and his last album were both classics. It's in this line where he cleverly snipes both Cole and Drake at the same time, as they both criticize Kendrick's catalog as of late. Your first shit was classic, your last shit was tragic. Yeah, they, your both last after, one. Uh, they both went after uh, Mr. Morale. I'm Brick, yeah. you really not on shit. Kendrick claims that both Drake and J. Cole have no classic albums, and because this is entirely subjective, I do agree that Good Kid Mad City and Mr. Morel are both classics. A lot of people didn't like Mr. Morel, but I think it will prove to age as a body of work that will be appreciated with more time. And that's just my opinion. I mean, like, all these albums are going to connect with people differently. Let your core audience stomach that. Didn't tell them where you get your abs from. Obviously, you got the, there's an obvious one, double, the, the, the triple, you know, stomach, core, stomach, abs, core, audience, stomach, that time you get your abs from. Kendrick uses a play on Obviously, words to reference surgery. Drake allegedly getting work done to sculpt his abs. Kendrick uses this <laughs> reminds me of this funny meme I saw where it's like it showed this picture. Hold up. Oh crap. Um hold up. <laughs> where you get your abs from? Kendrick uses a play on words to reference Drake allegedly getting worked on this. So I saw a meme where I saw it was this picture. And it was like, Do y'all really y'all really think Kanye better than Drake? And it was like this picture of Drake, and there was like a picture of like Kanye where he was like, um, you know, like looking overweight, and then the quote tweet was, "This motherfucker really looked up Drake sexy and Kanye fat and made this tweet." <laughs> Sculpt his abs. Kendrick uses this wordplay to symbolize that Drake's core audience is not that of actual hip hop fans, and of course, just like his stomach, he's a fake person with fake music. And I know people are saying, like, "What's the big deal? He got work done." I agree. I don't think it's a big deal, but in the context of hip hop. It's just not something we've ever seen done before or be exposed. Like it's just it's not a hip hop type of thing to do. V12 is a fast one. Bro, bro, bro. Last one. Coming off the last line, Kendrick references a plastic surgery machine called the V12, mm -hmm. and of course it's obviously a reference to an engine Car. found in sports cars. Headshot for the year. You better walk around <laughs> like Daft Punk. Obvious. Just think about it. Not like us. Number one on the charts right now. Not going anywhere. Headshot for a fucking year. That record. I mean, yeah, wasn't that? another prediction, dude. I mean, yeah, it's just probably gonna be on the charts for a year. I mean, it's such a big song, dude. It's it's insane. Like how popular it's become with the subject matter of the song. Seeing how popular it's become is absolutely insane. It was already done at this point. Waiting and ready. Kendrick tells Drake that he's coming with a headshot that will leave him so embarrassed that he will be ashamed to be seen in public. He does this by making a reference to Daft Punk as they wear a masked helmet which completely conceals their identity. It's also important to note that Drake sampled Daft Punk on one of his recent hits. One more time, you gotta run a face. On to verse two. Remember? Kendrick starts. <laughs> anyway, we're just on the first two. Starts off by reciting Drake's track, Worst Behavior, where the premise of that entire song is Drake highlighting how he was never embraced, how people counted him out, and he's basically reminding those people of who he is today. Never loved us. Remember? The record is basically an in-your-face moment for Drake. Like, remember me? Remember how you treated me? Now look at me. It's a very clever callback from Kendrick as it highlights what he's been saying on this track. Drake was looked at as an outsider, but when artists realized that he could be used as a means of pushing their careers further, like getting a Drake feature, hmm. they started to embrace him. A hey, top dog, who the fuck they think they playing with? Extortion my middle name as soon as you jump off of that plane, bitch. Just like every good diss track, Kendrick is rebuttaling Drake's narratives from Right, yeah, trying to, you know, saying like, bruh, we're, I'm chill with top dog, bro. Like, what are you talking about? One of the main components of that diss, right down to the hook and the top. Yeah, that was the whole, that was the main purpose of the diss track, and he just stressed it down with one line here, I mean... Drake went so much, I mean, Kendrick went so much more deep than Drake's diss track. It's actually insane. He sits down his entire thing with that little one line. And the other, uh, the line after this where he goes, uh, he was signed to it, they were signed to it, they were signed to it. Title was directly tied to Kendrick allegedly being extorted by TDE. I'm allergic to the lame shit, only you like being famous. Yaddy can't give you no swag. <laughs> Yaddy, uh, Ghost Rider. Either. I don't give a fuck about who you're hanging with. When we really sit back and think about this thing, Kendrick and Drake couldn't be more different. 
These guys are literally polar opposites, not just in music that they make, but in the way that they move, the way that they live, the things that are important to them, their values, their moral compass. They are just two completely different people. <laughs> it's pretty clear that Kendrick does. That's why it's the beef of the, between them is just so good. He doesn't value fame. He's not on social media. He's very quiet, reserved. He's not flashy. The line about Little Yachty is in reference to Drake's friendship with him. Drake is excellent at remaining tapped into what the youth are doing, and people like Yachty act as a vessel to doing just that. I hate the way that you walk, the way that you talk, I hate the way that you dress. Coming back to the Kill Bill theory, the way that Drake walks, talks, and dresses are all aspects that are tied to his costume. Kendrick hates these things not because of what they represent, but because it's not authentic to Drake's true identity. This line didn't surprise me in the slightest. I truly believe that Drake has made attempts to make amends with Kendrick over the years. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to, yeah, trying to, trying to befriend him so this shit wouldn't happen. <laughs> and likely wanted to get back in his... This serial club is one of the greatest clips of all time. I'm talking about his fruity pebble strategy. Good graces. Why I, don't, I don't agree with the strategy, though. I do not like that shit a bit soggy, dude. Come on, now. you gotta have that shit crunchy. While we know Drake is competitive, I believe he wanted to make Kendrick an asset rather than an enemy. However, because of the differences in these two... Mm. Yeah, he was trying to use him to, you know, get accepted by the culture, quote-unquote, like he did all the other artists, but Kendrick it was like, nah, but... People, Kendrick probably realized pretty quickly that Drake wasn't someone that he cared to get along with. Drake and Kendrick have been exchanging subliminals for the better part of a decade, and while Drake maybe viewed this as friendly sparring, Kendrick has proven to be someone that values the crown in a different way. Fuck the big three, it's just big me. I even hate when you say the word nigga, but that's just me, I guess. Some shit just cringeworthy, you ain't even gotta be deep, I guess. So another line with an extreme amount of depth culturally. You need to think about how and where Kendrick grew up. Kendrick is from Compton, Section 8 Projects to be specific. His family has direct ties to gang culture. He was five years old when his city was tipped upside down during the Rodney King rides. When you think about the use of the N-word and the history of how it became a thing in African-American culture, what he's saying makes even more sense. America has deep ties to slavery literally in the millions. In the case of Drake, he grew up in Canada, a place that does not have a history of black slavery. In fact, Canada only has 4,000 documented slaves. Then when we look at... I never knew that. Wow. Well, I guess that makes sense because like cold as hell up there. They don't need people to like... They never needed people to just, like, in the fields because they don't, like, have much plants or farmland up there. How Drake grew up, being raised in an affluent white neighborhood, going to very good schools, it's 100% clear that the N-word wasn't something that he heard being used. He didn't hear it from his mother's family. He didn't hear it from his fr friends. He didn't hear it at school. It just wasn't intertwined with his upbringing. Basically, there came a day in Drake's music career where he decided that he was going to start using the word. It isn't a natural thing for him, and it never was. Kendrick looks at Drake's use of the N-word just like the other aspects that make up his costume. This is not even up for debate. Like, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to tell you that that word clearly doesn't fit into the way that Drake speaks naturally. And I saw that a lot of people tried to pigeonhole yeah. Kendrick on this record as being racist, but that's not what no. any of this actually means. It's not a race thing, it's a culture thing. Kendrick is not trying to disregard that Drake is half black, he's just pointing out the elephant in the room. Matter of fact, I ain't even bleed him yet, can I bleed him? Bad. When I see you stand by sexy red, I believe you see two bad bitches. Yeah, iconic, well, another iconic line from this. He starts by adding some humor into the mix, poking fun at Drake's relationship with Sexy Red, where Kendrick essentially correlates Drake's energy with that of a female and not a man's. I believe you don't like women. It's real competition. You might pop ass with them. Kendrick then continues with the humor from the previous line. Sexy Red, along with their fan base, are known for twerking, and he says that Drake should join in on the fun. This of could course. also be in reference to the Maybe nickname coined for Drake by Rick Ross, BBL Drizzy. <laughs> Kendrick also seems to insinuate that Drake of could course. be gay, alluding to how sexy Red is his real competition when it comes to male attention. 
He also alludes to Sexy Red as being another form of competition when it comes to the actual music. However, the line also has a more serious tone as Kendrick could be alluding to the fact that Drake doesn't like women because he likes younger girls. <laughs> I mean, at this point, it's been Thanks. Kendrick's main angle that, that he's been playing for most of his records, right? Let's speak on percentage. Show me your splits. I'll make sure I double back with you. Kendrick continues to chip away at Drake's narrative from push-ups, rebuttaling Drake's lines regarding contract splits, and Kendrick seems fairly confident that his circumstance is still better than Drake's. You were signed to a nigga that signed to a nigga that said he was signed to that nigga. Again, I think the one I thought that they're talking about because he signed to Wayne, who signed to Birdman, who signed to UMG. All part of his strategy, which Kanye talked about in his shitty, uh, <laughs> like that, uh, Remix, yo dot, I got you. Shut up, bro. <laughs> On this track, Kendrick is pulling previous information from others, and in this case, it is Pusha T's reference from Exodus 23 and 1. You sign to one nigga, the sign to another nigga, the sign to three niggas. Now that's bad luck. Because Drake mm. criticized Kendrick regarding his contract splits, he ultimately opened himself up entirely to being rebuttaled with a situation that could possibly be even worse. Kendrick alleges that Drake tried to strike down the Like That record, which is an allegation that seemingly might be true, as we have seen leaked emails surface that potentially confirm it. Now, there could very well be sound. some truth to it, <laughs> but anyone can make one of those emails. Like, I can make one of those emails that looks just like that in five minutes. Back to back. I like that record. I'm gonna get back to that. <laughs> he does get back to that and more. What a record. <laughs> Kendrick claims that he likes Drake's record against Meek Mill back to back and proceeds to dish out a double entendre. Firstly, Kendrick announces on his track that he's going back to back on Drake which proved to be true as that's exactly what he did on the upcoming diss tracks. Secondly, notice how he uses the words for the record. He uses this to point out that he already took a loss against Pusha T, but he's about to add another L to his record, receiving back-to-back -back losses. <laughs> Why would I call around oh, oh, I like that. That's a nice one. I get turtle, nigga. I think I'm Literally back to back. L's. My life is rap. That's whole shit. I got a son to raise, but I can. <laughs> this is where he gets more deep into the family stuff. Obviously, he doesn't get that deep. Uh, well, as deep until family matters. I mean, not uh, meet the Grams after family matters. But yeah, this is the shit that uh. Oof. You don't know nothing about that. Kendrick alleged. This is when the, the this is the beginning of shit getting deep, 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 deep. Just that Drake <laughs> and OVO have been offering money for information to use against Kendrick in a diss track. Previously, Pusha T publicly stated that OVO was offering $100,000 in search of information for Drake to use in their beef. He then points out that he has kids to raise, and unlike Drake, that's his priority. However, this line has an even deeper meaning, as Drake's father was absent for a large chunk of his upbringing. Since my dad used to tell me he would come into the house to get me, he ain't show So when Kendrick says, you don't know nothing about that, He's saying that Drake could not know more. Yeah, there's this thing brought up by Pusha T as the cycle of dead beatenness where he's talking about you don't know nothing about a dad, your dad taking care of you. And you also don't know anything about you taking care, you being a dad taking care of someone. Just, you know, it's, a, it's a cycle that was brought up in Pusha T's diss track of the motivation of his breaking him down. Watch about fatherhood. We just then also later brought up in Meet the Grams where he's talking about history do repeat itself. Because he never experienced it himself. And this has been something that's been brought up in Drake's music a lot. So he he's hitting them in a sore spot with this. Waking them up, no nothing about that. They tell them to pray, no nothing about that. <laughs> Waking them up in the morning, telling them to pray, like things that Drake might not have had from from his dad. Teaching them morals, integrity, discipline. Listen, man, you don't know nothing about that. So again, this is one of the hardest angles on the disc, where he's saying that Drake's dad wasn't around to teach him morals, integrity, and discipline. Basically, he's saying if you lacked all those things growing up then how are you going to teach this to a child? You don't know nothing about that. And it's a brilliant angle because he's setting it up like this is the reason why Drake is the way he is today. You've got no morals. you got no integrity. Nobody taught you. Speaking the truth and consider what God's considering. You don't know nothing about that. And what Kendrick also means is that all these qualities that Drake lacks, that he can't teach his own kids, those are things that he's instilling into his own children that are important to him. Ain't 20 V1, it's 1 V20 if I got to smack niggas that right with you. 
<laughs> Obvious Barbas, so that, that's just a perfect rebuttal to the Drake line. Perfect Kendrick rebuttal. cleverly flips one of Drake's hardest <laughs> lines from push-ups where Drake alluded to the volume of people that were teaming up to conspire against him. What the fuck is this, a 20v1, nigga? Kendrick perfectly flips his narrative by claiming that it's really him who's outnumbered as Drake has a team of writers helping him to pen the verses. It ain't 20v1, it's 1v20. I gotta smack dudes that write for you. Like, that's fucking hard. Yeah, bring them out too. I clean them out too. Tell Beam that he better stay right with you. Kendrick alludes to the multi talented artist Beam, who is known for writing for artists like Beyonce, Justin Timberlake, and even appears on the writing credits for Drake's track Rich Flex. Coming off his last line about having to fight against 20 of Drake's writers, Kendrick claims that regardless of the quality of Drake's writers, he'll still clean them out, meaning he will defeat them easily. I love that simple reply to the whole AI track right there. The entire AI track just going through my battling ghost or AI, um, which is double because ghost as in ghost writers, but also ghost as in because you bring up the AI Tupac, like the ghost of Tupac telling you stuff. And yeah. Joel Austin, funny he... So it says Joel, Joel, Joel Alstein, which is the preacher dude, but you see also says it like Joel Hale, like Haley Joel Alstein. He's saying his name backwards to like combine their names for this. Listen a film called AI. And obviously this got, this got brought up, this brought up back again and not like us where he's, I see dead people. Yeah. And my sixth sense telling me to off him. These bars have quite a bit of depth and cause a lot of confusion and I'm going to try to clear it up here. In the first line, Kendrick asked the question if he is battling Ghost or AI, which feeds into his previous lines about Drake having Ghost Riders. However, battling Ghost is also in reference to Drake using an AI Tupac to diss Kendrick, and Tupac has been dead since 1996, so he is quite literally a ghost. He then makes reference to a famous but alleged corrupt pastor, Joel Osteen, who was accused of both using AI and Ghost Riders to pen his books and sermons. It's also important to note that Joel Osteen is riddled with plastic surgery, which could be a reference to the work that Drake had done himself. However, it gets mm. even deeper when you find out that Osteen's church was once caught in a child abuse this. scandal. One Ooh. of Osteen's volunteers was accused of doing this, and due to the narrative that Kendrick has levied against Drake's camp, this could also be another reference to just that. He then claims that Joel Osteen was in a movie called AI, which is actually incorrect, as it was a child star. Joel Hale. Hale. He says it. He says it. Okay. I don't think. Did you not get the. Okay. Ellie Joel Osmond. Joel it's Hale. unclear if this was intentional or a mistake, but I believe that Kendrick just simply used the name Joel to connect the two people. We then find out that the two Joels are even more connected as Haley Joel Osmond starred in the. He says Joel L, but he says Joel Hale. Uh. movies AI and The Sixth Sense. The line contains even more depth when we look at the fact that Haley Joel Osment's character could see and connect with Ghost in the movie The Sixth Sense. This ties perfectly into Drake's AI Tupac gimmick because without being able to talk to Ghost, how could he really know if Tupac approved of what he was doing? That line is yeah. also crazy. Yeah, Obi ho niggas is dick riders. Tell them run to America to imitate heritage. They can't imitate this violence. So, following with the theme of Drake being an outsider in this Back line, he's theme. not just aiming at Drake, but at Toronto as a whole. Run to America, Dang. they imitate heritage, is Kendrick basically saying that the people of Toronto attempt to imitate LA gang culture. As you'll see in the upcoming lines, Kendrick is mocking Toronto gangs for being imitators of LA gangs and saying that they <laughs> aren't a threat. And Drake showed a lot of disrespect to the West Coast with the AI shit, and now Kendrick's flipping that, dishing it back to him, hitting his city. Don't speak on the family, Crody. He can get deep in the family, Crody. Kendrick doesn't appreciate Drake speaking on his family, as he did just that on the push-ups track, where he made suggestions regarding Kendrick's wife, Whitney. He then uses the term... <laughs> it can get deep in the family. It does get deep in the family, once again. Just foreshadowing <laughs> crody which is another major cultural reference crody is a name flip on the term brody which is a slang term derived from african culture brody is simply short for the term bro or brother which are terms of african vernacular dating back to the early 20th century however 
I don't know about that. In the last well. four or five years, the term crody has began to surface in Toronto gang culture and eventually became more widespread amongst the people of Toronto itself. Even Drake started saying it. Crody, turn me up. So Kendrick is really trying to drive two things home here. One, Drake is again stealing from a culture that he has little to no connections with. And two, Drake is now using gang vernacular, something else he has no ties to. And Drake also has a cat that's named Crody, so he's pretty much calling Drake a pussy. I, be a new <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that meaning a lot more. I like those little just subtle jabs right there. They're just funny as hell. With a dip sauce and a blammy, Crody. This line and obviously the new hooking thing comes back. Line is extremely clever and has more depth than what people believe. New Ho King is a Chinese restaurant located in Toronto, and years ago, Drake was robbed at this location for his watch. However, the line contains mm. way more depth when we look at this in the context of the Kill Bill movie. Oh, shit. One of the most highly regarded fight scenes of all time is when Uma Thurman is in a Chinese restaurant wearing the iconic yellow suit and fighting off countless people. Coming back to the fact that she recently offered Drake this suit and the fact that Kendrick flipped the 20v1 theory to claim that it's really him who has this battle, the line is even more crazy as Kendrick is claiming that he will be in Drake City and that he's ready to take on everyone. Just think about it. She offers Drake the yellow suit for 20v1. He just flipped that line on him. Now he's in Drake City in a Chinese food. Like... The reference makes that line even more fucking crazy, but everyone missed it. And that's why I take my time with this shit, because this is important. We don't want yeah, I like that. Yeah, so basically saying, yeah, so you started off the track with comparing him to Uma Thurman and saying he was a liar. And then you flipped the 20v1 thing to say now he's the 20v1 going up against all these people in the, in the restaurant. I like that. I really, yeah. I really like that flip out. Once again, I've never seen anyone catch this. So yeah, this is like by far the best analysis I've ever seen on this track on YouTube. Very good. So again, as I explained before, people have taken this at a context in an attempt to make this about color, but this is not what Kendrick means. The thing. entire premise of this record is quite literally painting Drake as a cultural outsider. In order to achieve this, Kendrick used the strategy of hitting Drake with undisputed truths. Kendrick's goal in this record was to showcase the elements that Drake incorporated into the costume that is his hip-hop persona. We yeah, this is the only track that I think everything in it is like not like a debatable thing. Like there's stuff like, oh, well, he could have been lying and meet the Grams, you know. The, you know, the whole pedo thing could be a lie, given that... Yeah, <laughs> bit of a lot of odd things attached to it, but you know, this is the only track where it's like, okay, even if you don't believe the allegations against Drake, this is still a fantastic. He still breaks them down and all the sh shit about him. So, I saw references from people within the undisputed truth, you could say, culture like Pusha T, Joe Budden, DMX, Rick Ross, and Meek Mill. Kendrick did this not because he didn't have any new information but to drive home that the culture has already removed the mask from Drake on mm. its own. This explains Kendrick's strategic use of the quote from The Wiz, everything they say about me is true. And let me remind you guys, I am not treating this thing like a fucking race. Like, I'm looking at the bigger picture of what all this means, knowing that in 10, 20 years, people are going to want to watch videos like this one, and I want that to be my video. Like, I'm a white mm. dude... Who is I'm a guest in this culture, you know, like if I can attach my name to this in any way, that is more than any money I'll ever make or, or any plaque or anything. What's the dirt is so dope. Alright, so that is Kendrick's Euphoria does actually explain tons of new info by um What's the Dirt? Um uh, fantastic video, by far the best breakdown I've ever seen of this. I mean it's an hour long breakdown of a six minute song. So yeah, I'm pretty sure he caught everything or anything if he didn't catch something, uh, I certainly didn't catch it. Um But yeah, what do you think? I think this has gotta be one of the most well written songs I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean every bar basically a double entendre going at Drake with a whole, you know, theme of him being fake, you know, hike taking off the mask and hyping up um, and he's basically telling all the allegations that have already been said against him, saying that everything they they have said about him is true, and then, you know, predicting that Drake's next move and that he's gonna power back and 
bring on some new information when she does in Meet the Grams and not like us, which is fantastic. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed this video. If you like my, uh, me, to, uh, my, just me, looking at stuff about hip hop, we're gonna do hip hop album reactions, uh, starting on this channel, but eventually move to the Lyric React Music channel. Subscribe to this channel. Uh, yep. Support the support of all creator. And I don't have much else to say about that, but yeah, fantastic video. And, yeah, goodbye.